So uh, started focusing a little bit on the uh, mental disorders and was struck by, you know, this resolution isn't right, but uh, so you can't see the whole slide. Oh, the guy's gone too. So the Huntington's disease was uh, one that came to light, uh, uh, highlighted in the 60s by Woody Guthrie dying of this disease, and it was a pretty straightforward uh, disease to elucidate because there was a very strong genetic pattern of segregation in families, and so the ability to use very straightforward genetics, family-based genetics, to lock onto the Huntington's uh, disease gene and and figure that out was, uh, was of course, a really striking success of uh, human genetics. And of course, this was put on steroids with all the cool technologies that came to light and enabled sequencing and genotyping at really low cost. So we thought that we would achieve that same kind of success across all diseases by genotyping, you know, being able to look at, uh, being able to look at lots of DNA, uh, genotype it, correlate it with disease status, and, and from there figure out the complexity of, of human disease. And the problem with that has been, you know, sort of highlighted here, where we have things like uh, APOE uh, and Alzheimer's disease, something that was discovered 19 years ago, and a gazillion dollars spent, right, on, on, uh, on uh, that and, and uh, other pathways associated with AD to come up with new treatments. And, and after all that money spent, we still don't know how AP affects your risk of AD. We still don't know if AP is, APOE is even the causative gene. And uh, we don't understand the context in which APOE operates. And in, and in other areas uh, where we have like height, the highly heritable trait, we have upwards of 1,000 loci now uh, that have been identified for height. And so what do you do with 1,000 genetic loci? Uh, that there is no single pathway involved in this. There, there are networks comprised of uh, thousands of genes. And so this is uh, just to take us to the point of, you know, we're not going to solve these types of disease through, through linear thinking and through one-dimensional views. And uh, what we need to be focused on are, are how these variables are interacting. So, the, so you imagine we have DNA in the red and, and metabolites in the yellow and protein in the green and RNA in the, in the blue. And these things are, of course, uh, being perturbed in a, in a system like a cell and being connected in, in very uh, complex ways. And once these networks form, you know, they're not uh, isolated, right? They're interacting as a system of, of networks of networks uh, to define the coherence of a, of a living system. And once we have sort of these fundamental units, these sub-networks that define biological processes that underlie the phenotypes we care about, we can start getting away from the single gene view of disease or traits and start thinking about these networks as functional units and how change in one functional unit can cause changes in another functional unit, so it's sort of a meta-level mapping. And this may be taking place within a cell or a given tissue, but of course we know that uh, systems are complicated and, and comprise of multiple different tissue and, and cell types. And so what we really want to understand is this communication throughout the whole system, right? We want to understand not just how things are communicating within a cell, but how they're communicating between cells and, and ultimately between tissues and organs to, to comprise the, the full complexity of the system. So in order to achieve that sort of feat, of course, uh, uh, we need to be able to assay things at ever more detailed levels. And one of the things that drew me to, to Pacific Biosciences was this technology that was developed to look at single molecules at a time to uh, observe them directly as they're carrying out some process of interest. And in this case, uh, the first uh, instance of the machine will be looking at DNA polymerase at single molecule resolution and in real time as it's sequencing, synthesizing a strand of DNA. And that type of technology is very cool, right? Based on uh, zero mode uh, waveguide transmission below cutoff. And, and the idea is you're isolating a single molecule of that DNA polymerase in a, in a tiny little hole, what's known as a zero mode waveguide. You've isolated it at the bottom of the hole. And when you bounce a laser on the underside, it only illuminates the very bottom portion of that hole because the laser light's too big to fit through that waveguide. So you get a confinement volume of 10 to the minus 21 uh, uh, liters. And so you can ignore all the rest of the stuff going on in that system and just see what's, what's going on in that, that tiny hole. And one of the things that struck me the most about this uh, technology was the fact that you're observing that enzyme in real time as it's carrying out the synthesis process. And so here's just an animation of the uh, DNA polymerase as it's uh, synthesizing DNA. And, and the one thing we found about these enzymes, or it's obviously well known, is that they're exquisitely sensitive to context, right? The sequence composition of the uh, sequence that's being synthesized uh, really defines the kinetics of that enzyme. 
And so you can start looking at shifts in the kinetics across different sequences to uncover uh, the type of epigenetic changes that we just heard about, like uh, hydroxymethyl C. So as an example here, what we have here are two different strands of DNA. They're identical with the exception of this A residue being methylated in this case and unmethylated in this case. When we look at a trace from the, from the sequencing reaction, see we see these different color pulses of light. So these are the different nucleotides that are being observed, time along this axis, intensity along the y-axis. So now we see these color bursts of light indicating which nucleotides being incorporated during the reaction. And look at what happens when that enzyme encounters a, a residue that's been methylated versus uh, unmethylated. Since you're able to observe the molecule in real time, look at the time it takes to translocate to the next base when that A is modified versus not modified. So these types of kinetic shifts in the enzyme can be systematically scored in a whole bunch of modifications, not just 5-methyl-C, not just hydroxymethyl-C, not just methyl, uh, six methyl uh, adenosine, but a whole range of chemical modifications, both known and unknown, can be very ob objectively scored in a, in a systematic fashion. And so here's just some of the known uh, types of modifications that occur in, in uh, DNA that uh, most of these known to have some kind of function on uh, you know, regulatory context. And, and today, the only one that can be scored systematically uh, at genome scales is 5-methyl-C. Uh, but with, uh, with this technology from PacBio, we can uh, see every single one of these uh, modifications and, and not only see them uh, um, uh, each in, in a, you know, across the whole genome, but we can get to single base pair resolution, strand-specific resolution. And because these leave sort of, of, of uh, different signatures for each one of the modifications, we can discriminate between them. So here's just an example. I thought I'd just uh, change the slide in as I heard the, the last talk. But this is from uh, mitochondria uh, uh, DNA that was isolated from neurons. And um, so what you're looking at here is we, we sequenced the mitochondrial DNA from, from neur isolated from neurons human, uh, from human brain. And, and what's being plotted here is the minus log 10 to the p value for both the plus and minus strain of these kinetic shift events that, that we see in, in a given sample. So all of these peaks um, that you see here are very, very significant, highly reproducible shifts in the kinetics of the enzyme that underlie different uh, types of chemical modifications. And in here, we're, we're absolutely seeing 8-OxoG. We think we're seeing 6-methyladenosine. Uh, uh, we think we are seeing hydroxymethyl-C. So a lot of validation going on. But then we also think we're seeing things that are completely unknown, that, that haven't uh, been observed before. So we don't know if it's oxidative damage or, or what it might be, but it opens a whole new window into really understanding you know, what, what, what is uh, the composition of, of DNA. And it's not just AGCs and T's or, or not just six nucleotides either. And so here's just an example of getting at single molecule resolution with that kind of assay where you're able to look. And uh, uh, so this is uh, four molecules of uh, that sequence uh, from this exact same sample. And you're, since you're able to read that same molecule over and over again, these red are indicating shifts in the kinetics. So here you can see a location on this molecule that's changed. This is an 8-oxo-G change, the same on this other molecule, but then doesn't exist on other molecules. So now we actually get a quantitative estimate of, of the number of molecules that are, that are modified versus unmodified in, in the same sample. So this type of uh, technology combined with many other types of technologies can actually get us to uh, uh, more comprehensive models of a system. So once we're generating all this information, we want to integrate it. And uh, how, do we, how do we go about that? And, uh, well, we're scoring lots of variables. So the first thing we can do is we're sampling different variables, whether it's, whether it's gene expression or DNA variation or clinical type traits. We're sampling in a population, and we can, we can see when things are, are actually correlated. But, but, and, and from these correlations, we may uh, derive hypotheses that we want to test. Uh, for causality, and, and the way we typically do that is we have a hypothesis that we want to test, and we set up some experiment in the lab. So now we're looking at, say, an, an animal model, and we're looking at these traits over time, and we see that they're correlated. And so how do we establish causality? Well, we set the system up, and now we want to artificially perturb this gene and then look for a subsequent response in the gene that we think is downstream of it. So we see that sort of action, and then we infer a causal relationship. The one thing uh, I had a problem with with this type of perturbation system, whether it's chemical or, or artificial knockouts or knock-ins, whatever, 
is that it's, it's artificial. And, they, and what happens when you pound a system in an artificial way, you induce artificial correlations that have no relevance to the, to the system under study. So what I started thinking about was how we could use DNA variation as our natural perturbation source to infer the causality. Because the DNA variation occurring in populations allows us to stratify populations given two traits of interest by genotype at a given locus. So we can look at changes in DNA at a given location and look at how they correlate with changes in the traits we care about. So in this case, we're seeing at this given locus that changes in DNA are correlating with uh, changes in this trait and changes in this trait. The beauty of this is it's naturally occurring perturbation, right? These are the perturbations that are giving you disease or causing you to have uh, alterations in, in, uh, in a drug response. And once we have that information, now we can look at um, a single gene or a single DNA locus. And if we have that, it's correlated with two phenotypes of interest, then we can mathematically model how those genes are related to one another. So only three basic possibilities exist. Either the DNA variation causes changes in phenotype one, that goes on to cause changes in phenotype two, or vice versa, or that DNA perturbation event independently affects both. So now we can model these and we can do it systematically, not over uh, just two pairs of genes, but over all pairs of genes through an entire space, and from that reconstruct uh, networks. So I'm gonna jump over um, the example I had in yeast to, to show you that this all works. This was published in Nature a couple years ago. I can give you the reference. But I'll, I'll also go, I wanted to spend a little bit of time because what I've been talking about is DNA variation, molecular phenotypes like metabolites, RNA sequencing, or protein. But we can also integrate into that same, uh, 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 those same networks uh, imaging-based data. So we have uh, uh, here just showing you some structural and functional MRI data. So this is structural data that here I'm looking at uh, schizophrenia. And we've uh, looked at many different regions of the, uh, of the brain. And we've looked at many different individuals, some normal, some with schizophrenia. And we see patterns that are distinguishing between uh, the two states. And since we have a population, we can start using this, again, the DNA variation as a perturbation source to start understanding how these are connected. How are the functional and the structural MRI measurements causally related to schizophrenia given that DNA perturbation source? And then we can start uncovering probabilistic causal networks. So here we're going from cluster of, uh, of imaging-based data to networks of imaging-based data where we're understanding how those different nodes in the network which can not only be expression, but can be these Im imaging um, or, or structural imaging or functional imaging traits as well, how these fit together in networks and how these networks can be differentially connected uh, between disease and normal state. It's not just differential expression or change as in mean, it's differentially connected. How do you change as you're, uh, how are you hooked up to the, to the network in different ways? And based on that sort of information, we can start combining imaging-based networks with gene expression type networks to understand what are the genetic modulators that modulated the change in, in connectivity structure of uh, the co-expression network for Alzheimer's uh, versus, or schizophrenia versus the change in structure for uh, the imaging data. And we can start linking those together because genetic modulators are, are affecting both at once. Right? So we can tie those together and start coming up with a more integrated network. So the way we apply this to Alzheimer's uh, disease, just take you through some, some of the steps that we go through to characterize this type of disease, is we start with a, a, you know, a human population where we're looking at many tissues at once. In the case of the Alzheimer's, I'll show you where we looked at uh, three different parts of the brain. Uh, we had about 800 or so um, subjects from that study. And uh, roughly a third of those were Alzheimer's, a third were Huntington's, and, and a third were non-dementia um, individuals. And uh, so we collect all that information. We also had lots of uh, uh, other details uh, regarding those samples that were collected, and, and so pretty well characterized. Uh, we isolate DNA, we genotype or sequence, we isolate RNA, we, we sequence or, or profile. And uh, uh, the first step is we want to look at, since these are post-mortem, right, so there's all the debate about whether these are going to be relevant or not, we take a lot of the different types of traits that we had scored on that population, and we build this little network to see, you know, whether there's coherence in the data. So in this case, we're building a network of, of interactions between all these different traits that were scored in that, that particular brain cohort, 
and red is if, if those traits are positively correlated, green if they're negatively correlated. And basically you start seeing these blocks are indicating different subnetworks that are, that are really recapitulating uh, some of the different structures that were being looked at, like telling you at least that there's some coherence in, in that data. It's not completely uh, a mess. And then you want to associate with, with some of the different measures that were scored that are relevant to Alzheimer's. We want to sort of look at these different bra brain regions. We had visual cortex, cerebellum, and uh, prefrontal cortex. And want to look at those brain expression measures and see do we get significant signatures for their association to these different uh, traits that may be relevant to Alzheimer's. And uh, so here you're just getting the, the, the measures, the number of genes that are correlated with those traits. And this is at a I believe a 5% uh, FDR. So now you want to take all of that gene information, you want to organize it, right? You want to organize it into, the, into these network structures so we can build these network structures that aren't just focused on a single tissue but span multiple tissues. And what we get when we, we organize that information here, you get all these color bars which represent subnetworks, and we can depict those in a different kind of way to give you a feel for, for what's actually going on in all those different subnetworks. But they sort of break out, again, into all of these different functions functional units that are enriched for different biological processes that, that uh, we care about and want to test for association to the diseases we're looking at. So here are all the different blocks of uh, functional units that sort of break out of that. And now we want to start leveraging the DNA variation information as the perturbation source. But before we do that, I just wanted to highlight that these networks, one of the fundamental things we've been trying to uncover isn't just differential expression, say, between Alzheimer's uh, disease and, and control, but differential connectivity. How are these, how's the topology of these networks changing? Because what we find are genes that may not be differentially expressed between those two conditions, but how they're plugged into the network changes dramatically. So what I'm showing you here are just the degrees of uh, some of the uh, different functional units that I showed on the previous slide that are highly differentially connected between the normal and the, and the Alzheimer's state. So here what we're looking at are genes and their connectivity patterns. So again, you're looking at sort of correlations of correlations. And so here you're seeing high connectivity in the Alzheimer's case for the, for the genes making this module versus not very highly connected in the, in, the, in the normal case. And so you see this sort of differential connectivity going on all through the, all through the system. And, and again, how th those networks are arranged is very, very critical if you want to understand in the system. Now we want to layer in the DNA variation information to go away from these interaction-based networks and into probabilistic causal networks, right? So we're going to take ourselves out of this association-based network and go into this probabilistic causal network by layering in the SNP-based information as the perturbation source. From that, we're going to get these networks that we can start, their directed edges, so we can start understanding what statistically uh, looks like it's uh, causing uh, other uh, nodes to change, giving changes in a given node. And this is just to show you the impact of that eSNP, of the SNP information on these different traits that we care about. So here we're just looking at these QQ plots, looking at the deviation from the, from the diagonal, which, which is sort of giving you a sense of the true signal. And here what we're looking at are the SNPs that are associated with the activity of those genes across any of the different tissues we are profiling. And what you can see is a pretty dramatic uh, signature for uh, these eSNPs that associate with expression associating with traits that are uh, associated with Alzheimer's or that we associate with Alzheimer's. So this is across the whole space. This is across a specific network that we published in Nature a couple years ago on metabolic activity being associated with diabetes and heart disease, a very strong player in the brain uh, being associated with Alzheimer's. And, uh, and then actually go from this type of network to the causal regulators of that network. And I'll just show you a picture of what that looks like. So now we can take one of those networks. This is from that metabolic network. We can see how things are uh, uh, connected. But again, this is statistical inference, right? This isn't your classic causality type, uh, uh, type diagram. This is a statistically inferred causality diagram. And we can identify these key regulators. These are the, these are the nodes that are capturing most of the variation from the perturbation source they're, they're, the information's funneling through those red nodes and then has the broadest impact on the activity or connectivity structure of all the other nodes in, in the network. So we think those are the ones you want to target, whether it's for biomarker or, or, or therapeutic intervention. And we haven't gotten all the way to going from these regulators to uh, treatments for um, Alzheimer's, but I'll just show you, just to finish, a quick example of how we took that same network that I showed you that was causal for Alzheimer's 
and uh, uh, did for diabetes, came up with a novel treatment for obesity and diabetes. And the way you play that game, again, is so here's this network that we had identified. Uh, we have a paper coming showing it's causal for Alzheimer's, but we had also shown in a paper in Nature a few years ago that it was uh, highly causal for atherosclerosis and diabetes and obesity. So now we want to understand what, what are the genes in this network that we want to target for therapeutic intervention. And the way we play that game is once we have this probabilistic causal network, we can, via simulation, go through and start hitting each of those nodes in silico, do the in silico knockdown experiment, and see which ones are, are modulating the activity of that network in the, in the most significant ways. And when we do this, one of the genes we come up with is this novel phosphatase gene. So here, you're, uh, if you're downregulated if you're red, upregulated if you're green. In our network, just through the predictions that if we downregulate ppm one l we will treat type 2 diabetes because we're going to raise insulin levels and lower glucose levels. Uh, but then we're going to do something else. We're going to raise uh, fat mass. We're going to make you fatter. And we're going to start affecting genes that are known to affect hypertension and, and in the wrong direction. So this network gives you lots and lots of context to not just look at a single gene, but what it's, what's the context and what is it operating, not just with other genes, but with the clinical traits as well. So in this case, we have some, some good things that are happening, but also some bad things that are happening. And when we go in and validate that, our predictions are, are validated. So we show that the glucose uh, was lower. This was a glucose tolerance test, just as we predicted. Uh, but we also showed that the fat mass was increased. So here's the knockdown animal versus the wild type, this is males. Uh, so very significant weight difference. Uh, this was all due to fat mass, uh, the same in females. And then also, as we predicted, we had increased blood pressure. So, so again, potentially increasing cardiovascular risk. So this is an example where we're able to, from the network we predicted, you would treat your type 2 diabetes, but you'd get fat, and maybe you'd have a heart attack. And of course, we don't like those kinds of drugs because <laughs> they cause bad things to happen. And, and what was interesting about this example is PPM1L is located in the network next to PPAR gamma. They're, they're uh, in the same part of the network, interacting with each other uh, in the statistical sense. And what do we know about uh, PPAR gamma now? Rosiglitazone was the drug uh, targeting PPAR gamma for treatment of type 2 diabetes. It's marketed as Avandia. And what we know about Avandia is it lowers your glucose, makes you fatter, and increases your cardiovascular risk, just as we predicted uh, from the network. So this sort of thing could be avoided, again, by having this more context-rich thing to uh, inform in. But of course, we, we don't want to say everything's bad. We want to also look for things that are good. Uh, so that's a kind of program that got halted. It was under development at Merck, but got halted, uh, given uh, the type of information we were able to provide. But then we can search the network for those causal regulators as well that affect things all in the good direction. So here's uh, P2RY14. Uh, again, it was a key information hub node in the network. And we predicted that if you downregulate that guy, uh, you're going you're gonna to raise insulin levels. You're going to lower glucose levels. That's good. You're going to lower cholesterol levels. That's good. You're going to increase leptin levels and decrease fat mass levels. That's good. So we were seeing this acting in all the good directions uh, without any of the liabilities that we were seeing for other genes in that network, like PPM1L. And so based on that information, we did, a, we did do a targeted validation in, in vivo to validate that finding. And based on that, a drug was uh, developed uh, targeting uh, P2RY14, it's orphan GPCR. And here's uh, just the results of that. Animals on a high-fat diet over a four-week period of time, percent weight gain over baseline. Here's the animals on placebo. Here's the low dose of the drug, medium dose of the drug, high dose of the drug. On the high dose of the drug, they're looking better than the pink curve, which are the animals on a normal uh, lean diet. So this also reduced uh, lipids. It reduced. Um, uh, glucose levels. So, so again, had a lot of these uh, positive benefits that we had uh, predicted from the network, and it's an example that went all the way to the drug. So the hope is that we can do that same sort of thing. And it's very interesting that the exact same network is also involved causally, or at least we're predicting, for uh, Alzheimer's. So we're you know, in the process of studying uh, the connections between uh, those things we're targeting for type 2 diabetes and, and Alzheimer's. But that's the sort of uh, integrated uh, view we hope can have an impact and just wanted to thank uh, a bunch of groups. Obviously the group at PacBio has been awesome for all the cool technology we have to throw out the problems and then just some of the different, you know, the Sage Bio networks that I co-founded with Stephen Friend and some of the academic partners to get access to the populations and samples and to profile. So thank you. <laughs>